welcome to um, Heart Talks. And uh, we're in the middle of International Women's Month 2022. And we just celebrated International Women's Day uh, just two weeks ago. There's been a ton of discussion on what everybody's doing, what they wanna do, and how we can continue to support women. And so for us at Her Healthy Q and so many people around the world, the future of women and women's health is really on our minds. Women are the backbone of society in almost every country and region, and without their health, they are not able to contribute to the community, to their family, and to society. So even if you're not in healthcare, International Women's Month and events and commitments, you know, affect you as well. I mean, or at least they, they should. Um, we're, we are all really working towards a more equitable society, and one in which that includes women of all levels of life. So whether you're at a leading women's health company of the world, a climate organization, or you are an advocate, women are integral for the advancement of society, for change, and for industry. I'm Marissa Fayer, the CEO of Her Healthy Q, and I'm honored to moderate this episode of Her Talks. It's uh, and Her Talks was created as a discussion series where we bring together different minds, industries, and opinions to talk about uh, a chosen topic, one that we vary uh, every single her, her talk. This month, we're going to be focused on what's next and where we go from here as a result of after International Women's Month. It's a really, you know, it's a really big discussion that's important to Her Healthy Q's mission, which is, um, which is providing healthcare equipment to developing countries with a focus on women's health, health non-communicable diseases, because non-communicable diseases can be detected, prevented, and treated with equipment if they only had it. And so I'm so humbled and honored to be joined by these incredible panelists and I'll let them do their own justice of briefly introducing themselves. And then we're gonna jump into the discussion. So first we'll start with Susan, who's the VP of Global Medical Affairs and the head of the Global Women's Health Index at Hologic. We'll then go to Kelly, who's the Director of Marketing and Corporate Partnerships at earthday.org. And then Lauren, who's an author, video producer and a disability advocate. So Susan, you wanna kick us off? Thank you so much. I'm just delighted to be here and be part of this conversation. Um, I, I do work at Hologic. My background is 30 years in academic medicine in breast imaging. And my research was regarding costs and resource use across the continuum of breast, breast cancer care, including high income and low and middle income countries. I'm fortunate to have been married for almost 32 years and I have two children and they have played a huge role in my career by being supportive as well. So thank you and I'll pass off to Kelly. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you, Marissa. Um, really so lovely to be here. Um, as Marissa mentioned, I am the Director of Sponsorships at Marketing at EarthDay.org, where I have the privilege to work with companies on bringing their sustainability objectives to life really through tangible action, right? And so this might mean um, working on an employee engagement strategy to plant trees or to um, do a local cleanup, but it's really about how can we bring everyone together to, uh, to, to move the needle on climate change. Um, and so my background is working again with companies on philanthropic giving strategies, um, employee engagement, cause marketing programs. And I'm just delighted to be here today to talk about how women are a huge part of the climate solution. And I'll pass it over. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Marissa. It's a pleasure to be here with also uh, Susan as well. I am Lauren J. Rotolo. I am the author of Unstoppable in Stilettos, a disability advocate and video producer, and most recently has left her day job in order to live her dreams um, of being a full-time advocate and speaker. I'm so thrilled to be here, um, not only with three unstoppable women, but during International Women's Month so we could raise awareness of women's issues today. Amazing, ladies, thank you so much. And listen, like if there's any time anyone in the audience has a question or a comment, feel free to re read it, uh, write it in the chat. Um, I will try my hardest to get to all of them. Um, and, and so we're just gonna dive in and get started. And so in our pre-chat, there was a lot of themes that came up 
between all of us and you know what we're working on, what we're passionate on. And I, I mean, obviously, given that we are a women's health company and all women here, you know, it, it is women's health. Um, but we talked about a lot about like data and measurement and mental health and working in partnerships and following passions. So I'm excited to have this discussion. So um, let me start with um, Susan. So Dr. Harvey, you you work at you know Hologic, which is a leading women, the, the leading women's health company. Um, obviously, that's super near and dear to my, my heart. Um, I worked at Hologic for nine years, and the idea for Her Healthy Q was developed as a result of work that I completed at Hologic Costa Rica, and that continues today, which is so exciting. Um, I'm sure you've been super involved with a lot of um, the International Women's Day discussions, and you've been part of those discussions. So what are some of the themes that you've seen come out of this year's discussions? Is there anything very thematic or is it very random? Well, I, I have to say, I love the, the UN theme, gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. And it allows us to celebrate all of the amazing things that women have done, innovations, leadership, medical, medical innovations around COVID. It also allows us to remember that there are so many inequities that impact women. And those include gender-based violence, climate change, conflicts, the Ukraine, Ethiopia, and Afghanistan. And I always put the health filter on thinking about these themes. If we just consider gender violence, violence against women, in the Hologic Global Women's Health Index, we asked women about domestic violence, 1.7 billion women. So that's the population of China and the US. 1.7 billion women told us that there were significant issues with gender violence where they live. In the United States, that was nine out of 10 women. And 800 million women told us they did not feel safe walking at night. One of the first features of health is, is the woman safe? If we think about disparities that are happening in income, only 17% of women live in high income countries. And yet that income gap creates a healthcare gap that is tremendous. Um, it's not always just dollars, sometimes it's organization. So in the United States, white women have a two-fold maternal mortality rate higher than most developed or high-income countries. And then if we look at the US and we add race into that, black women, four times the maternal death rate of other high-income developed countries. Breast cancer death is much higher, 41% higher for black women than white women. And and we consider the impact of climate change. Women are out doing work in the heat when they're pregnant. So there, there are maternal fetal issues, basic needs are not met. In the majority of the world, women eat last. The men are fed, the children are fed. If there's not enough food, that means the women aren't fed. So in thinking about how do we live into gender equality, today for a sustainable tomorrow, let's look at these issues and begin to take action to address them. And that really will allow us to look forward to a sustainable tomorrow. As you pointed out, Marissa, women are the backbone, families, communities, and economies. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, I, and I just wanna add one thing is, you know, if you add disabled women, to that list, it's 80% of disabled women have been sexually abused in one way, shape, or form. And that's 10 times higher than the average woman just here in the United States. I mean, so we also need to think about adding disabled women to that bucket of other women. And you know, that's why I have left my day job to say we need to start including this community because they are not heard and they are being abused and they're not, you know, they're not being hired, they're being abused. There's, there's so many things we could list a million things today, but it would just be great if we could start adding that and thinking about, because you're already vulnerable. And I think that people see that and therefore they abuse the power of being vulnerable. 
Thank you so much, Lauren. It's a, it's a critical point. Yeah, Susan, maybe that's something to add to the index next year yeah. as well. Absolutely. Um, wow. Um, no, that's a startling fact. And Lauren, actually, let me jump to you. So, you know, obviously in your intro, you told us, you know, you're an incredible advocate. You're, you know, this amazing speaker and producer. You know, as you said, you, 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 you decided to lean into your passions even more than you were already doing before. I mean, you've, you've been doing that and now you just fully decided to do that. Um, you know, so tell us like, what, what are you working on and how, <clears throat> how is this related to women besides the fact that you are one, um, you know, and, and just, you know, our health, because I, I think we'd all really like to hear kind of now what you're starting to, to lean into even further. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the question. I think that, you know, the pandemic has really shown us a, a lot, you know, whether it be good or bad, there was a lot of bad, but I think that a lot of good came out of it as well. And I think that we as not only women, but as a human race really started to think about what's important in life. And I know for myself, um, as a disabled woman with a rare disease that's called McCune Albright syndrome, you know, no one has ever really been an advocate or has been transparent about the rare disease community. And as I think about it more and more, my disability was really much more of an asset to me and for me, and my voice was even a bigger asset. So as the pandemic started to come to an end um, and some some regions, not everywhere, I don't know if we'll ever fully be out of it, but um, I just needed to do what was important to me. And I just needed to say, this is this one life and I don't want to be sheltered anymore. And I think that a lot of people, you know, there's a billion disabled people in the world. Um, again, another staggering fact that people don't don't really think about, but we've never truly had a full movement. And I think that it's voices like myself to say, I am not only a woman, but I am disabled. And I think that being women, it takes us a certain amount to hit that glass ceiling. Well, I'm here to say that it it's going to take us a long time, and I hope to see it in my future, um, a disabled woman as a CEO. I think that we need to really start thinking about women, not only just disabled women, but people in the workplace. And that is a goal of mine and to really give this community a voice and to say that we are innovators and we, we are the people that can change the way the workplace really is today, you know, if you think about it, um, Susan and I were having a conversation right before I came on and I said, you know, just being a woman, I've had to grow up. I literally had to grow up at nine months old when I got my period. And, you know, your whole life can change in a matter of seconds. And I think it's really important that women today really stand up and showcase what we're not, what we're going through, as you were saying, you know, we're the last ones to eat. We're the last ones. We put the house together every single day. So imagine if there were just more powerful voices like us in the world, just imagine the change. And so I really want to be part of that change and be the voice behind the change. Lauren, we know you're going to do it, and I think you're probably going to be that first disabled CEO. I mean, I, I, but I don't think anybody has a doubt in that, <laughs> quite honestly. I mean, let's just be clear. I don't think any of us have any doubt. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, I, and we will support I you. Forward to, I look forward to the future and hearing your words as we all step in, the, in those boardrooms today. For sure, for sure. Um, I wanted to make the switch over to Kelly. So... So I know it probably seems random for everybody that like a women's health focused nonprofit would have a climate and earth focused organization on our her talks. I mean, it, it, it's it's random. Um, I and I get that, but not really. So like, why is it important for EarthDay.org to integrate women into the discussion and include women in climate change and women and in, include women into you know a lot of the programs that you're creating in the you know in the partnerships? Like why? Why, like, why, how are you related to women? You know, yeah. that's like the big I question. I mean, 
<laughs> Very reasonable question, right? And I think um, we've already had some really thoughtful answers and a conversation already with Susan and Lauren. One of those big themes is the power of women, right? And so I would say that, you know, women and the climate solution are really inextricably linked. Um, you know, when we talk about achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls, we are actually talking about igniting like a waterfall effect that results in better education, that results in reduced poverty levels, better health and well being, right? Improved work conditions, economic growth, like the list goes on. And one of those is, of course, climate action. Um, and so, you know, I talked briefly in my introduction about how I have worked with companies in the past to um, create giving programs. Um, you know, prior to just prior to Earth Day, I was working um, with Global Giving to help create disaster recovery programs and became really familiar with how some of the most devastating effects of climate change, you know, natural disasters, climate exacerbated conflict, famine, destruction of property, all of these things disproportionately affect women. Um, but we are this unbelievably untapped resource that can help communities adapt to changing environmental circumstances, whether they are a slow onset or whether or not they are in a flash when a typhoon hits or a tornado comes barreling through. Um, we're here to kind of help find those practical solutions as well and, and be the, the igniter of change. And so, you know, some people talk about climate change and climate action as a thing that has to be solved by policy or by technology. Um, but I think really we just need to bring more women to the table. Um, and that starts with equality. And that starts with, you know, removing restrictions on things like land ownership in parts of the world um, to providing better training and better education for women and ultimately transitioning from a place where women are this overlooked resource um, with their voices backbenched to really being leaders to offering these pragmatic solutions, holistic solutions and unleashing their voices um, to get things moving um, and, you know, honestly, with an army of support behind them. Kelly, why is it that women are disproportionately affected um, by climate change and climate disaster? Sure. So um, things as small as maybe not being able to swim, right? That's one of them. Um, not having the resources to build a shelter um, or the training behind it, right? It's, it's little tiny things like that or being the ones that are on, at home, being the caretakers for um, the children and being responsible for making sure that they're moving to higher ground. Um, there are a ton of different reasons that um, women ultimately get the brunt of, of what's happening. That's so interesting. I never... Mm -hmm. I guess I, you know, like I thought, like you think about it and obviously there's a ton of women who are, you know, farmers. And so, you know, you have to follow your crops and if there's a drought, you know, they're moving, but, you know, it's, it's thinking about, you swim, I mean, little things like, like swimming or, yeah. you know, having to move your children first and all the children get to move. And the last one, you know, you know, you, you shut a child over your head first, you know, over right. yourself. And that's, um, you know, that's a very maternal instinct for sure, mm -hmm. I think for, for, for anybody. Um, oh, that's really interesting to think about. Um, thanks. Wow. Well, I have a um, question. How do you bring it back to healthcare? So if you think about women as nurses or frontline healthcare workers mm -hmm. in, you know, developing countries or mm -hmm. in, you know, wealthy countries, how do you really educate those kind of women to empower sustainability. I know, you know, my last job, I most recently worked at Johnson and Johnson and it was mm -hmm. a major factor for sustainability, especially for, you know, for everything that the company did. And we really spoke to the frontline healthcare worker about that as well. So how, I'm sorry, so you're asking how- and How do you educate the frontline, you know, when, it, right. when it has, speaking about medicine here, how mm -hmm. do we take sustainability into medical care, into day-to-day -day medical care and into our hospitals and into, you know, and educate the doctors and nurses that are, you know, men and women. Mm -hmm. So incorporating almost like a, a, like a nature therapy or an environmental therapy as a part of like a holistic solution for, um, is, am I, am I heading down the right path with you? I think Susan has a. Well, and just the transformation of care models that are present mm -hmm. um, 
transformation of care models will allow a wide variety of disabled and underserved women to enter. And in I know radiology the, the most in medicine because that's where I focus. The majority of radiologists are men. And so how do we look at racial or gender-based disparities in healthcare training? I mean, that goes back to middle school mm -hmm. yeah. and it sets the standard and it sets an education priority that directs women and, and, um, and black and Hispanic women, disabled women in that way. It doesn't just start at medical school admissions. That is not at all. So we're thinking about how do we get more women healthcare providers? We have to change the model of care. We have to transform the respect and treatment of women in healthcare. I, I lived 30 years in academic centers and I can tell you some stories that would curl your hair. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, you know, this whole concept of transforming that begins with education mm -hmm. and we have to keep women in education and we have to allow them to see there is a future and possibility. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we also have to allow girls, you know, to pursue science and math. And it's not like allow, it's, it's encourage them to do that. You know, that's another part of it because then potentially they want to become a nurse. They want to go into healthcare. They want to do all of these things. You know, if you're if you're not down that path, you typically are not going to do that. And you know, we also have to incorporate all other emerging markets, developing country. You know, all of those as well. And the reason why girls are disproportionately pulled out of school is, you know, first for menstrual reasons, and then secondly because you know their their caretakers, their mothers, their aunts, their grandmothers. Um, are disproportionately not, you know, they're not well or they're ill or, uh, or they've passed away. And so the, the, it's the girls that have to take care of the family. And Daughter. so unfortunately, you know, yeah. and this is some of the work that we continue to, this is why we do what we do. Cause you know, there's no point in building more schools if the girls can't go. And right. so, you know, the reason why, you know, the, these, these girls all around the world need to go to school so that we can start to change this equation you know, to make sure that they are part of the healthcare solution. The other thing that, Lauren, I know you were saying that there were some positive, positive, positive things that came out of the pandemic. A really big one is this whole telemedicine and, and uh, tele-ed and educational ed tech and all of this, where there's this more, more, you know, uh, learned and, and it's more part of the, you know, the conversation and everyone understands what it is, even though it's been around for 10 years. And mm -hmm. so, you know, having remote learning, having different ways of talking and learning and training um, for healthcare providers and healthcare um, uh, centers as well all around the world. And I think that that's a really big part uh, of the discussion and making sure that there's access to maybe it's remote care, maybe it's access to, um, you know, being able to read radiology scans or even just you know, taking, you know, your phone and, and looking in your throat to, to, you know, to see if there's something there. I mean, you, you can do that remotely. Yeah, yeah no. And I'd love to link this back to, and, um, and Lauren, you brought this up. Um, it's not just women, it's women and girls. Mm -hmm. And teen pregnancy has a devastating impact on women's health, every feature of women's health. There are two countries in the world, and we have this again based on the um, partnership with the Gallup World Poll, Australia and New Zealand are the two countries in the world where teen pregnancy does not necessarily derail a teenager's life. Their support system and their network in regards to health care is robust enough. But mm -hmm. in the United States, 33% of women told us that they had a pregnancy before the age of 19, that goes up to 50% if you're a black woman or high school education or below. That wipes out that group of people to ever advance through and become healthcare providers and, and really limits empowerment 
overall. So Lauren, I want to thank you for reminding me about girls. And I think Kelly, I interrupted you, so I will stop now. Oh. <laughs> thank you. No, that's really great. Thank you. And and Susan, actually, I wanted to ask you because we were talking, you were talking, giving out a lot of the stats. And so mm -hmm. I'm assuming a lot of that's coming out of the Global Women's Health Index. And um, I know you have a partnership with Gallup on that. And, you know, can you just tell us, tell, tell the audience, tell everybody, you know, like, what it is, maybe, you know, I know you just were citing some more, you know, some, some statistics from it, what it is, what the future is, what's next, you know, um, just to, to hear kind of what that is. Well, thanks so much. And, you know, about two and a half years ago, Steve McMillan, the CEO of Hologic, was looking at global expansion of the company. We are a global company, but we're um, not all over the world. And so he wanted to understand what's the state of women's health globally. And what we identified was there's no organization, there's no institution that actually tracks women's health. So if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and you certainly can't improve it. Mm -hmm. So that's how the partnership with Gallup World Poll developed. And Gallup is a survey tool. So what we were doing in 116 countries and 140 languages was listening to women and girls listening about their lived experiences of healthcare and their opinions of health and safety. And that brought together a brand new set of data that doesn't replace, but it augments other data sets that tend to be from governments and can carry agendas, governments and, and other organizations. And sometimes those data sets carry agendas. This is from the women themselves. And what we learned, there are five dimensions of health five dimensions, preventive care, basic needs, individual health, emotional health and health and safety, opinions of health and safety. Those five dimensions explain 80% of a woman's life expectancy. Preventive care is the most important in that list of five. Gallup using, uses weighting statistics. And that's about all I got. If we have specific questions, I'll get you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> fair. That's totally fair. Wasn't asking on how Gallup does it. That's yeah. probably so, really proprietary. <laughs> yeah. And we found out that on a score of 100, the world average, global average was 54. Every single country in the world has work to do. We heard from a billion women that they had not spoken to a healthcare provider in the prior year. And 1.5 billion women had not had any preventive care. So high blood pressure testing, cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer in the world. Only 33% of women, it's a simple test and it's not fancy equipment. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> cancer, any kind of cancer, second biggest killer, over 5 million women a year die of cancer. We're looking, we're looking at the pandemic in 18 months, we've got 6 million reported. I know not all this data is 100% accurate, but it gives us a range. 12% mm -hmm. of women were screened for any kind of cancer around the world. <clears throat> Diabetes. But also, to your point, Susan, it not only has to do with access to care, but women are used to the ones that are taking care of everybody else too. So you're always the last one to be cared for. And I Absolutely. think that really you know, ties into all these statistics that you're seeing, you say, okay, well, as long as my children, my husband, my spouse, whatever it may be, my partner is okay. I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll just do mine tomorrow or whatever. And tomorrow may not come. Right. And then you get busy. And so therefore you, you don't make the time to get the health care that you need, but you know, something that we spoke about before, when we spoke last week, was also, I think, trust in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And when you think yes. about trust in healthcare, um, especially for low income communities, they don't have any. And how do, you know, we need to change that perception. And we saw so much of that during the pandemic with the vaccines. And I think, you know, and if you also think about that in the environment, I don't think that people trust where do I get that trusted information from, right? Mm -hmm. right, right. Where, who is going to tell me the real thing? Because, you know, do you think sustainability and Earth Day is just about recycling? Do you think, you know, like, what are you, 
Right. What do people really know? And where is, where is that trusted source? And I think that sure. there are so many people that don't really know where to get the information that they're looking for, for that trusted information today. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. There's a, there was a second poll that we did with Gallup in the United States, and we asked women where they got their information about healthcare. And some of the women answered primary care provider, but a lot of women don't have a primary care provider. And those women are going to social media. To your point, Lauren, about vaccination, the things that were on social media about COVID vaccinations, if that's your source, I, you wouldn't walk in the door. And so you're absolutely right. Education, critically important for women's health. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, Kelly, I wanted to actually, you know, kind of take the, that part of the, this part of the discussion. And, you know, I'm thinking that partnerships <laughs> really make a big deal, you know, and, and make a difference in some of these communications around anything that anybody's working on and anything that has to do with education. And so, you know, why you've been working with them for, you know, your entire career and, and you know, even previous to earthday.org, you know, you've been working, as you said, on partnerships with different, you know, with corporations. So like, why are they so important? Why would, why would nonprofits and, you know, and, and corporations, why do they want to partner? Like, what's the point? How does it help everybody? Like, you know, I, I I know some of the answers, but I think like it'd be really interesting to have, you know, besides the obvious one of like money to do right. the work, right. you know, sure. but like, but why, you know, like why, why to push yeah. climate change or women's health or any other changes we want? Like why, why move this forward? Like through these kind of partnerships? Mm -hmm. No, that's, I, I love this question because partnerships are just, they're so critical, right? It's always this one plus one equals three. Um, and so, you know, we've talked a little bit about kind of my, the work I've done in the past, but I, I wrote a lot about the responsibility, right? Like the power that comes with having the responsibility of being a company that can have this influence on people, right? Because you're, you know, companies are influencing consumer behavior. They are influencing culture, individual decision-making that ultimately leads to trends and like cultural shift, right? That is a huge responsibility. And so partnerships are a really big part of that. Um, I'm, and, and just this massive opportunity as well. So, you know, I, I used to write about kind of like these different calls to action, like different ways for companies to step up, whether or not it's to be more thoughtful, more proactive in their philanthropy, thinking really strategically about how they're investing in different causes. So whether it was, um, you know, being proactive about investment in like disaster mitigation, right? And what does that look like? Well, it's, you know, let's go to a flood prone region and build the houses up on stilts right? That's like a little thing that we can do that would have a huge economic and community benefit because then when, you know, a place that is, you know, frequently hit with floods, then there's going to be a lot less recovery. Um, so like little things like that. Um, also, there are programs, um, you know, one of the programs I worked on, um, a lot of recovery, like when, when COVID was first beginning, right? So many giving programs, companies really did step up to the plate to invest heavily in COVID relief programs. Sometimes it was um, supporting, you know, basic, like, oh my gosh, just like N95 masks and the medical equipment that was needed, but also thinking really carefully about the communities that were affected. I think, I think gosh, Susan, in your first answer, you talked about the um, domestic violence and gender-based violence and the increase that we saw during COVID. And so one of the most impactful partnerships, you know, that I worked on um, was with, um, gosh, the North Face and Supreme T-shirts who launched a limited edition T-shirt that raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. And those funds went to community-based groups that were working with women in vulnerable areas that were trying to escape, that needed to escape, that needed a safe place to be because they were victims of domestic violence. And that is the kind of partnership, the kind of like strategic thought leadership that is needed from companies because these things need to be brought to light. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I, I would encourage, you know, nonprofits and companies to just be really thoughtful about how they come together because the opportunity for impact is huge when you get the right people together. Um, and when you think about it of like, what is your end goal? What is your objective? How can we get there and how can we do it together so that we are not only, um, you know, spreading the, the, 
message that <laughs> it, it, it just can't be so transactional, right? We're moving away from transactional to like meaningful and impactful. And I'm grateful to the companies that are doing that. Mm -hmm. And then you are also noticing the shift that you know, 80%, I think it's 80% of consumers are actually going to switch brands. If there's going to be a brand, you know, they might be Pepsi every day of their life and then decide to switch over to Coke, Coca-Cola, because that's the brand that they want to. That's the cause that they're affiliated with, right? That's not a great example, but I mean, hopefully you can understand kind of what, how, how, what that opportunity looks like. Um, so whether or not, you know, if you're a company and you're listening to this and you're thinking about what your, you know, impact is going to be, think about the communities and the individuals and how you can make it really tangible because these partnerships are huge. Um, and there's just so much opportunity and so much like, the change that you wish to affect, it can happen and it can happen right here and now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, like, listen, pause marketing today. I think that- Oh my gosh. Pause marketing really helps us Yes. You know, not only increase the company's brand reputation, but you also then can attach yourself to consumers mm -hmm. and to purchasers who, you know, really then connect, as you were saying. And if you think about women, women are the purchasers of the house. Oh, you know, absolutely. Where you are in the world, you will always see that the woman is going to go out there and spend that money. And if she absolutely. believes and in your brand, you're automatically going to raise your awareness. Right. And, and as a mom of a four-year-old, I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to pick out the brands that I know are having some sort of impact in their community. Right. Yeah. And I'm going to spend more money on Same that product money. every single time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and our one of our um, listeners just said, Indrani just said, you know, we can vote with our money, just got mm -hmm. exactly what this is. And, yeah. and I know right. I've personally switched to so many other brands that, you know, I heard of them because of their causes first. I didn't even know who these brands were. And, and right. a lot of them are now going out with that kind of marketing, which I think is really, mm -hmm. you know, really, really interesting. Um, Lauren, I wanted to ask you as well, you know, like, you know, we keep talking about health and access and everything. And so as a woman with disability, um, <laughs> like, why do you think women are, are overlooked in the medical industry and how do we change that in the future? And I know that that's something that you're working on, so we don't need to give away all your secrets, but um, <laughs> you know, like how can we, how, like, why? Like, you know, it's, I, guess, I guess it seems in the work that all of us do, like there should be no reason, but like why and how do we change this? Like what are maybe one or two examples that, you know, we can do to change and help promote this change that, that you're working so hard on? Well, I think that first and foremost, it starts with, you know, if we want to get more women into medicine today, um, whether that be doctors or nurses or researchers, scientists, whatever it may be, I think we need to really open up the minds in your junior highs and your high schools and create STEM programs first and foremost. So they really have that access and that understanding. I think that, you know, Susan, you said before, the pandemic really changed the way that people look at healthcare today. You know, all of a sudden your champions and your celebrities were the scientists and were the doctors. Um, and so I think we need to keep a steady flow of that and keep that energy going. But I think that, you know, if, they, if you look at like somebody like me who was disabled from the time that she was 18 months old, truly disabled, um, I never had a female doctor. I never even saw a female doctor until, to be honest, I was in my mid twenties. They just were not, they were not around. You saw them as nurses. You saw them as, you know, techs, you know, they, they were techs, they were taking my x-rays, but they were not, they were not overseeing my medical care. Um, even OBGYNs, you saw more male than female. And I would have to say that over time, even somebody like me who was constantly and you know, my mother and my grandmother, we always champion women. You just thought about a doctor and he was automatically male. You didn't even assume that a woman would be a doctor. And I think that we have done a good job in changing the trajectory of that. But I think that we still need to do a better, a, a much better job at that, especially I think 
you know, within the sciences and within the scientists. And, you know, even today, like if we spoke about being like the first female CEO, uh, disabled CEO, you know, there's not many women CEOs of pharmaceutical companies or that of medical programs. And so I think that we still have a lot to do, but I think, again, it starts with the education and it starts with creating a need um, and giving women the access that they need to not only be the head of the household, but be the head of a hospital. And, and I think we have to remember, uh, and I speak, I, I say this because of personal experience, women's careers can take longer because during childbearing years, those are hard years when women really do feel it, the pull of, of their families and young children. And so there tends to be a pause. So we have to, we have to let everyone know, hey, that's okay. We're expecting this. It doesn't, you know, in academics, women would get to a point, have children and drop off the cliff. Mm -hmm. We can't let that continue to happen, right? We have to support through that. My first pregnancy, I had four, I was a fellow, I had four weeks of maternity leave. I had a complicated pregnancy and a huge postpartum bleed. I spent the first week in the ICU. Three weeks later, I went back to work. <laughs> like, you, you cannot sustain that. I was young, I was lucky, but we have to support um, women and show, Lauren, to your point, show that this is an opportunity. That mm -hmm. We can make your life reasonable. We know it's going to take longer. We know we need to support you, but we're willing to do that. And, and more women will come. It's happening. It is truly happening. Yeah. But Lauren, terrific points. Thank oh, you. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Susan, is that some of the work that you're doing um, with the Project Health Equality um, uh, project that, that you're working on? Is that, you know, is that something that you guys are focused on um, just generally trying to, to bring up these, um, you know, equity and equality issues? Um, and, you know, what else are you guys focused on? You know, so Project Health Equality is the second, um, I'll, I'll call it philanthropic, um, work by Hologic, and it's U.S. focused. And the point is to transform women's healthcare together with partnerships and based on the incredible disparities that are present in the United States health healthcare system. And Lauren, now I am totally keyed in to disabled women as well. Thank you so much. It's a multi-year initiative and there are three prongs, data collection, education and awareness and actual care models to provide care. Why are we doing it? 40% higher death rates from breast cancer in black women, two times higher death rates from cervical cancer mm -hmm. in black women, Hispanic women, 40% higher cervical cancer incidence. And with these three pillars, we will use the data to educate patients, providers, governments. Right now, Missouri is pending legislation to ban abortion in ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy, the fetus dies, and about 50% of the time untreated, the mother dies. Our government and policymakers don't necessarily understand the topics they're legislating. And that is unbelievable. So we will use that data, which is about barriers, outcomes to care and patient satisfaction to improve education and policy, government education as well, and also to improve the care model. So we nail it. So Lauren, women are available and they do have sites that they can afford and come into. So a model that's sustainable and scalable to the US and um, I like to dream big globally, right? I mean, so, let's hope, yeah. Let's hope. I think to um, also, like you spoke about the data, the data is so important. Like if you think about for our, for the organization that I'm part of, which is for my disease, the virus dysplasia organization, um, 
McKinnon Albright's Fibrous Dysplasia Alliance, actually, it's we have a registry and it's so important that the patients fill out the registry because these, this is where the scientists are gonna look. So, you know, become part of clinical trials, fill out these registries without the data. People just think like it, it doesn't just happen in the lab. Like we need participation in order to create that change and to order for us to understand, you know, what's happening in medicine, what's happening to people. You know, there's um, Greta here is talking about pain. You know, I traveled this over the summer and did this amazing series for Johnson and Johnson that spoke about racism in healthcare. And one of the biggest things that we did speak about was maternal mortality and how doctors really do not, especially when it comes to the black and Latin community, they do not believe that their pain level is different than those of white women. And, you know, I can't speak to that because I am a white woman, but I'm a white woman with a rare disease. So I understand that I truly have a lot of pain, but if I'm going to my doctor, I believe that I'm gonna be telling the truth and they need to believe them too and do more pain studies and understand why people of different communities have different levels of pain or they are, or they will get diabetes at a younger age, you know, with, without people being part of the programs and being part of the science, it's almost impossible for us to get anywhere. Yeah. It's and I think so, it's so interesting, uh, you know, just to say like that, this is only, this is only in the States. I, I mean, just imagine what this looks like on a global scale for some of these statistics. I mean, cancers aren't even reported. Like nobody even, you don't even know that you have some of these diseases or heart disease or diabetes because there's, there's no way to test it. And you, you know, you could be dying or incapacitated and not even literally know why. And, you know, one of the reasons is, is because a lot of people are displaced, you know, as a result of, um, you know, climate change, uh, you know, there's just not access to it. There's, you know, there's so many other things to worry about. There's wars that are happening, you know, there's all of these things. And, you know, and we talk a lot and, and all of us are pretty data driven. Like we talk about a lot of statistics. I mean, the statistics, statistics aren't even, you know, reliable to be calculated to so, so many different regions and countries because you sure. just don't even know, you know, if you don't have pre preventive screenings, you have no idea how, what your rate of cervical cancer is in, uh, you know, in a country that has one, you know, one colposcope to, to, to detect for cervical yeah. cancer. I um, fund a clinic um, which I helped set up. It is a cervical and breast cancer screening clinic attached to a PEPFAR site in the northeast of South Africa. The town is Hotesbrit, and some people know it because it's near Kruger Game Park. Yeah. And when we tried to find data on numbers of cancers, there's something called verbal autopsy. So when a family member dies, someone goes and knocks on the door and says, what did your family member die of? And that's what's written down. So to your point, we don't have big data and it's a challenge to fix it. And yeah. yet data, if we can't measure, we're not gonna be able to manage it. So um, pressing forward in that, but, but Marissa, 100%, we have to be very careful about the data we use and understand its origins and accuracy. Yeah, I just think, you know, some of these conditions are worse than we think. Um, and, and listen, let's hope that some of them are better than we think. Um, but, it, you know, as people are moving all around, um, I think that it's, it, you know, yeah, it's just, it's just astonishing. And, you know, we're getting close to time. I think we're probably even over time. And I know we were supposed to have questions of each other and et cetera, but I think we keep asking them in between, which I'm really, you know, happy about. <laughs> Is there one last, uh, you know, question that you guys wanted to ask of each other before I do a quick wrap up? We've been asking oh, a ton, really so I just want to make sure. Don't want to put anybody on the spot. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I would say I had Susan. What's next in medical devices for women? Amazing question. Oh, there's. Oh, it's such a great. So again, I'll focus on breast cancer alarm because, um, that's that's my background. So, for example, there are non-surgical, minimally invasive 
treatments for breast cancer that are as effective as lumpectomy. Wow. And so we are moving in that direction. There are molecular diagnostics that are assisting women getting the right chemotherapy. And, and ideally that happens for all women. And, and let's think about how, how we can use this. There, there are some very rapid tests with polymerase chain reaction. And those tests can be used where pathology facilities don't exist in low resource areas. So if you don't need to scale a pathology lab or an operating theater, you can close this down and have access in a much broader way, a single visit, detect, diagnose, and treat a breast cancer. So that is part of where we're heading. And um, the other part, Lauren, that's so important is risk. We need to understand risk. And the family history and the genetics and all that, that's great, but that's only about 10% of breast cancers. We need to truly understand when a woman comes in for imaging, what is the right imaging tool for her? Is it the right interval? And, and will it give us results that can definitively determine <coughs> if there's a breast cancer present? So we're moving in all those directions. Sorry. No, that's your bro. No, no, no. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So wow. lots, lots and lots coming. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. I think there's lots for us to, to look forward to. And so um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. And, and, you know, I think that we all can go on for another few hours, but I'll be mindful of everybody. So thank you all for being here. You know, I think some of the themes that really came up was um, we all need to work together. There's still a lot more work to be done. Um, and, you know, there's, there's so much for women around the world. And as we celebrate International Women's month and continue to until the end of the, the month, I mean, I think we need to be mindful of including all people, um, all races, all geographic areas. Uh, you know, we all need to work together and we all need to work together to, you know, hit the SDG goals. And um, I think it's just so important for, you know, for, for having this discussion. Um, so please join us in May, which is going to be our next Her Talks. We're going to be discussing a theme probably centered around mothers and maternal health. I mean, it is, you know, Mother's Day that month, um, hint, hint, put it on your calendars. Um, and we have another incredible lineup of speakers and we can't wait to have you join us. We'll send out invitations shortly. Um, until then, please reach out to any and all of us to be, you know, that are part of this discussion. If there's anything you'd like to discuss with any one of us, please do so. If there's any, anything you'd like to discuss, you know about her LTQ um, or support our work um, for the betterment of women's health around the world, reach out to me or the team. And thank you to everybody who joined. Thank you to our incredible speakers and um, happy International Women's Month. Still uh, another week to go. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. Thank Susan you, Marissa. Lauren. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Lauren and Kelly. Thank you. Thank you.